not far away. Let's start story. It's where my mama was born, it's where I come from, it's where my daddy fell in love not long ago. Aloha everyone, this is Larry Camp, and welcome to the Nobody Knows Your Story podcast, which just happens to come with a side of Hawaiiana. Nobody Knows Your Story is a podcast which I believe will impact each listener in a positive way. As you listen to the experiences that have transformed, shaped, and guided each guest, perhaps you'll better understand your own personal journey. Some will surprise, some will make you question, and some will inspire, but all will leave you in a better place for listening in. As for the Hawaiiana, well, that's just a big part of my life story. So I invite you to check in from time to time, or better still, Add Nobody Knows Your Story to your list of favorite podcasts. You'll enjoy hearing the life experiences of people just like you. Maybe you should skip work, baby. Take a little trip with me today. It's summertime and I want to know. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for choosing to listen to Nobody Knows Your Story. I say choosing, you know, because there's over 5 million podcasts now. When I started three and a half years ago, there wasn't even a million. So you really have a choice to be here today, and I do appreciate it. Now, we just heard The Green perform Summertime, and mid-podcast, we'll hear Mocktown from Baba B. Sharing her story today is Trang Nova, who was born in Melbourne, Australia, and still calls Melbourne her home. (laughs) I'm laughing because we discussed how Melbourne is pronounced, because I was going to say Melbourne. (laughs) Anyway, as we chat today, Trang is, she's actually in Bali right now, and she's been there for the past four months, and I'm sure traveling is going to be a big part of her story. So Trang, welcome to Nobody Knows Your Story. Uh, Thank you so much for having me, Larry. I'm, I'm very delighted to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, it's well. We've we've already had kind of a fun conversation before we got going, but <laughs> like dis- discussing where you were from. <laughs> yes, yeah. Like it's just so cool to talk to different people from all over the world, and the fact that I'm in the future right now that still blows my mind. That yeah, know, we should I'm, say I'm... that it's what Thursday afternoon where I am, and it's Friday morning where you are. Yeah. Exactly. So in the future. it's cool. <laughs> yeah, we're time traveling right now. That's what's happening. <laughs> and like I said, this is your show today. This is your story. I'm going to participate, but yeah, just anxious to hear all about, uh, you know, what you've done and what takes a person from Australia to Bali, what you're doing in your life. And, and I know you're going to talk about that. So yeah, take it away. Mm. My story has definitely not been straightforward, but is anyone's life story straightforward, right? Right. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I am the daughter of immigrant parents. Uh, if You might be able to tell that my name is Vietnamese. Trang is a Vietnamese name, but I have the most Australian accent you'll ever hear because I was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia, as you already mentioned, Larry. Uh, and my parents, they're, they're immigrants from Vietnam. So my upbringing was very interesting in that I got to have a confluence of both the Australian culture and, of course, the Vietnamese culture. And what that looked like was having a a big focus on academia, having a big focus on studying hard and working hard, because that's part of the Vietnamese culture. But also because my parents came from poverty and during like their my um, grandpa, so my mum's dad fled after the Civil War, Like what they have known is a lot of turbulence, uh, you know, poverty, uh, you know, 
instability. So they wanted to set me up for a life of stability and success. So there was a big focus on work hard, study hard, and then you can enjoy the reward of a successful and abundant life. That was a narrative. And I I want to jump in there for a minute because you didn't just go to school, but when you got out of school, then you had tutoring. And Mm. on Saturdays, you took Vietnamese lessons. So, I mean, you were going to school like six days a week. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, like back then, that's all I knew. So uh, what you're referring to, Larry, was when I was in primary school, I would go to school, you know, nine o'clock to 3.30 in the afternoon. I'd come home and then my parents would give me extra tutoring at home after school. And, you know, I'm like seven or eight years old. Saturday, I go to Vietnamese school. That's all I know. But now I look back or when I talk to other people, they're like, you did what? Like, that is so much. But that, I just thought that was the lifestyle. I just thought that's what everyone did back then. Yeah. And now they're so, talking about here, they're talking about going to four day school weeks. I, I don't know. I just, education is something that I think I, I, I value it. My parents were both school teachers. So, I mean, I value education and to mm. think of taking or getting less. I don't know. I, I don't like that idea. I I do think that there there needs to be a compromise. I mean, maybe six days a week is a little much, but on the other hand, look how you've turned out, right? So, I mean, the the things that your parents wanted to instill in you and for you to have that they didn't have, it worked out pretty well. It it really did. And something that I look back and, and reflect on is how, because I didn't know any different, like that was just normal to me. Like I, I didn't really complain about it, especially being a young kid with so much energy. <laughs> like I could get three hours sleep and still have all the vitality in the world, right? So that wasn't too much for me at the time. Having said that, though, I was very blessed and very privileged in that uh, my my dad had a robust uh, income, so he was a doctor, and I got the opportunity to do a lot of co-curricular activities as well. Um, so it wasn't just study, study, study. That was a big part of my childhood, but I also got to learn music. I also got to play sports. Um, I also had a really beautiful, like tight-knit family because I was very lucky. My whole extended family had migrated from uh, Vietnam to Melbourne. So I had my grandparents my aunts and uncles, my cousins, and I'd get to see them every weekend. So it was a very full schedule, but it made me, you know, it it developed this like well-roundedness and this comprehensive experience of what life has to offer from a young age. Mm -hmm. Because I know you are a fellow podcaster, I've listened to a couple of your podcasts and I know that you like to run. Is that something you Mm -hmm. developed as a young person, or is that something that came on kind of later in life? It's funny because I did play different sports when I was young. So I, I started taekwondo when I was in primary school. I also played soccer, but the running itself that didn't come till later on. In fact, when I was in school, I hated running. Like you know when you know when schools have cross country or like mm-hmm. uh, athletics. I wasn't. I wasn't naturally good at sports. I just really enjoyed it. And the good thing about soccer or taekwondo is it's like really short bursts of activity, right? So you, you know, you might sprint after the ball and by soccer, I mean, football, depending on where we are in the world. And we did speak about this earlier. So a round ball kicking with the feet, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. No touching with the hands. Um, yeah, the, the great thing about these sports is they're short bursts of intensity and then you can kind of just like stand around and wait for the ball to come back your way, right? But then the long distance endurance stuff, like cross country running, where you might run for three, four, five kilometers, I couldn't do that. I'd run for 500 meters and then I'd be puffed out. Um, so it was actually later on when I was in year 12, so my final year of school, that, you know, naturally, uh, in many instances, not all, but in many instances, and this was the case for me, you know, I dropped back on my general activity and, you know, exercise. I wasn't doing as much sport because I was, you know, studying a little bit harder. So then I started to take on the adult version of exercise, which is not really playing as many team sports, but doing some sort of like planned intentional movement. So what that looked like for me was starting to do some five kilometer runs. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I I noticed how good I felt doing that. 
because I'd be sitting on my ass all day studying, right? Like hour after hour. And then I'd go out in the afternoon uh, during like twilight or just before sunset. And I would go for a five kilometer jog in a beautiful like autumn air or the spring air. And I just felt so empowered and I felt so good within myself. So then that continued on uh, and then eventually turned into this uh, obsession with endurance sports because then I went into uh, triathlon as well for a few years. But that's skipping forwards a little bit. That kind of was in my early adulthood. But yeah, there's been, sport has been a big part of my life um, because of the early introduction into it that made me realize how good it makes you feel and the fun of it as well. It's fun. <laughs> well, it is. And I'm with you there. I, I love sports, always been involved in participating and done the running thing. And so it's a lot of fun and and it keeps you in shape. And, it, and when you get to be older, the theory is, I guess, is if we do this throughout our life, then maybe we'll still be in shape as we get older. And, and so that's yeah. kind of what most of us want. We don't want to be sitting around all day watching Netflix, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I got to ask you about this. Uh, I know that in, in some of the notes that, that I got from you, you talked about this Catholic church group. I know people play sports at, uh, in, in church leagues. I mean, what kind of group was that? So you know how we were talking about six days a week? I went to Saturday school, uh, Vietnamese school. Well, on Sundays, it wasn't even a day off because I would then go to church. And what this was was a Vietnamese community in Melbourne, and it was a youth group where for an hour or an hour hour and a half, we would do some studies, maybe studying the Bible, but also, you know, different activities that were like team activities, kind of like, you know, just fun, you know, fun character developing activities. And we do that as part of the youth group component. And then at the end of that, we would go to mass for one hour or so. So that was every Sunday afternoon. And that was great as well, because there's so much that comes out of community, especially from a young age, like feeling supported, developing social skills, putting yourselves in different scenarios, and even the the learnings. Like, so I don't specifically, I guess, practice anymore. I don't really go to church anymore. But even the religious learnings give teaches you some really great life lessons. Mm -hmm. So that was a big part of my childhood as well. Every Sunday, we would go to church, we'd go to youth group. Seven days a week, that's going to keep you out of trouble, right? It very much did. I was the best (laughs) little good girl ever. And it's funny because I, you know, we'll, we'll touch on this. It that lasted only so long because I eventually I took on the uh, archetype of the rebel, you could say. I, I did eventually swing the other way. But yeah, I was a good girl for a long time before that. <laughs> you you have a, a younger sister too, right? I do. And so you were probably felt like you needed to be a little bit of an example and, and do good things and encourage her to do good things. I'm sure she went with you to Catholic you know, church on Sunday and different things like that and participated in some of those activities with you. Yeah, she did. And we were like two peas in a pod because we were only 18 months apart. So, you know, growing up, because we actually learned to speak Vietnamese before we learned to speak English, there was a period of time when we started school where we didn't know how to speak English yet. And because of that, we were, you know, the black sheep, we were the, the weird ones, we got bullied. So we stuck to each other and we had each other and could feel safe with each other throughout the early stages of school. Um, so yeah, I'm so grateful for her. And even though I am the older one, I've got to say she is the one who remained the good girl and the golden child even when I started to stray. (laughs) So she ended up being the one who was like a good example for me, interestingly. (laughs) I'm getting kind of excited to hear about the the rebel train. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I'm telling you, it's not a straightforward story. (laughs) (laughs) Now, did this happen at university? Uh, Was that kind of when things started to change? Earlier, actually. Um, and, And you've got daughters. So you've got a daughter or daughters? I have one daughter. Yep, she's 26. One daughter. Yeah. So I, I wonder, and you know what? It doesn't even need to be daughter. It could be sons as well. But you know the the dreaded teenage years, right? Mm-hmm. When when we start to make different friends, start to learn more about the world, start to maybe form our own identity and maybe question what our parents have taught us our whole lives. So I went through that phase and I went through it heavy because 
yeah, like I was such a good girl for a long time that that combines with my innate personality of ex- uh, experiential learning and exploration. I had to explore what else was out there. I just had to. Versus my sister, she never went through that rebellious phase because, you know, nature versus nurture, we had the same upbringing, but her personality was a little bit more, you know, content, you could say. Um, she was happy and she she was content with continuing on that path and not having to try different ways of living and different lifestyles. But when I was uh, about 14, 15, I started to get exposed to like partying in a very early stages of partying, um, you know, making different friends. And because of that, I, I had to just see what was out there. I had to try it out. And that's when I started this rebellious phase because I started to see that some of my friends their curfew wasn't 8 p.m. Their curfew was 11 p.m. And I was like, hold on a second. What's my curfew 8 p.m.? Like, I should be able to stay out late. And so then I started to really push against the boundaries that my parents had laid out for me. You got in trouble. Oh, yeah. But you know what? I, I'm, I'm <laughs> saying that I, I'm saying that I went through this rebellious phase, but I think, you know, it's all relative. Yeah. And if you were to look at my teenage years compared to many other teenagers, it was actually still very clean. You know, yeah. I, I've never actually, I've never smoked. I've never done any drugs. I drank underage, but, you know, who doesn't? <laughs> right. um, but, you know, in a very safe way, I still studied hard throughout this period because I think one that had been so deeply instilled into me that it just wouldn't be shaken off. You know, I would maybe go out partying on the weekends, hang out with friends, but there was a part of me that would still come home and I'd be like, I've got goals. I've got things that I'm working towards, especially because at that point, because I'd done so much tutoring and Saturday school and all those things, I developed, you know, a pretty high standard of performance at school, you could say. And that gave me a sense of meaning. You know, that gave me a sense of accomplishment and worthiness was, you know, my academic success. So that was part of my identity now. And that continued through even during these stages where I was discovering myself, you know, I was like playing around and exploring in different realms. But what stayed consistent was that I continued to study hard and keep my focus in terms of how I was performing at school. So I am actually quite proud of myself for that because young Trang, you know, 13, 14 years old, she was able to still kind of keep her head screwed on in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like you were competitive. I mean, that you liked being uh, acknowledged for maybe being in the top 10% in the class or something like that. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I think I think that was just so ingrained into me. Um, and it just became, uh, it just became kind of like something that was a given. Um, I was, yeah, I was a high performer. And then that became a big part of my identity. And it, it still is. And you mentioned that your father was a doctor. Did you have aspirations as a 12 or 14 year old to maybe go into medicine or did you have something you wanted to do when you were that age? Yeah. So this was, this was part of the exploration um, because, you know, my dad was a doctor and because of that, my, my parents and my mom was a stay at home mom. So that's kind of all I knew, you know, I knew what it looked like to work in the field of medicine and in the field of health. And my dad would go to work in the morning, he'd come home at night uh, and and they'd talk about, you know, how comfortable the family was because he was a doctor and how, um, how much respect he gets because he was a doctor. So that's actually all I knew. And it was kind of very implicitly, you know, imposed onto me that that was the direction I was going to go down. Um, having said that, though, I I did want to explore what else was out there. And at this at this time, when I was a teenager, I'd get, gotten into Hollywood movies, right? So I was like watching Twilight. Uh, I'm sure you know everyone remembers the Twilight phase, where where every single teenager was like had their head stuck in the Twilight books and watching the movies. And I remember I I was massively Team Jacob, the werewolf. You know, I, I had a massive crush on him. So part of me was like, I want to meet him. I'm going to marry him one day. And because I need to try and meet him, I need to get into the film industry. 
<laughs> I need to get into the film industry so I can like meet him. I can marry him. We're going to live happily ever after with three kids. And then I, I started to explore, you know, the film industry as well as journalism. Cause I was like, if I'm not going to get into the film industry, at least I can maybe like interview him for a magazine or something. And then I'll meet him. So that was actually the other pathway that I was very interested in, uh, journalism slash film industry. Cause that was a creative aspect of me as well that I, w- I was bringing out. And I remember the first time I ever uh, won something was when I was, I think, 15 years old. I was reading, you know, a magazine. It was one of those magazines for teenagers. I think it was called Dolly. And I had entered into a competition that Dolly had uh had you know offered in their magazine and this competition was if you write in a little you know entry it it was just like you know 100 words or something and uh, writing this entry then you get to come into the dolly office and spend a day there you'll get flown there because it was interstate it was still australian but from melbourne to sydney you'll get flown in and you get to spend a whole day uh, at the office where you, you get your makeup and hair done, you'll have a photo shoot, you'll get to meet all the, you know, the different um, people who work at this magazine office. Uh, and then I, I remember I entered into this and I didn't think anything of it because, you know, I was 15 at the time. I've never won anything in my life. But then one day when I was at school at lunchtime, I saw I had a missed call from this unknown number. So I go out to the side of the corridor. I call them back and it turned out to be the Dolly office and I had one. So I got to uh, get flown in. And my dad came as well because I was, you know, underage, needed to have some supervision, got flown in, spent a day there. And that really ignited what I like could potentially do for life, which is like this cool, it like seemed so cool at the time, this cool job where you go into this magazine office, you do fun things like interview celebrities and write, you know, write articles. And that was really fun as well. So I got to explore these different avenues. And those are such fun memories. When we look back at some of the opportunities we had, or like you said, this trip to Sydney, you still look back on it fondly now. And and I have those same types of memories from throughout my life. So those are those are fun things to have happen. Now I know you got your yeah. masters in physiotherapy, right? Yes. And physiotherapy, if I I'm looking right now, I'm trying to remember what the difference between cuz I was like what exactly does a physiotherapist do and mm. what is the difference between a physiotherapist and physical therapy? I want to talk about that a little bit just because I don't know that much about it. Of course. You did kind of go the medical route then. I did because the the gap in the story here was that I explored journalism, I explored the film industry, but then in the end, the prevailing narrative of choose a stable job so that you're secure and you don't have to travel so much and you might not, you know, be made redundant, that won. So then I chose to go into physiotherapy, which was like not as clinical and not as sterile as like medicine and becoming a doctor. To me, it was still fun because I could work with uh, athletes and I liked sport, right? So Mm -hmm. that made sense to me. So that's the path I chose to go down. And in Australia, we call the profession physiotherapy, uh, but it's actually the same thing as physical therapy. They're just called two different things between the States and Australia, but they are actually the same thing where we are working with individuals to help them overcome injury, uh, to overcome pain, and to develop their physical movement and functioning so that they can do whatever it is they want to, You know, whether it's playing with their kids, playing sport, running a marathon, or aging gracefully and being able to keep up their um, quality of life for as long as possible. When you were practicing that, and, and I'm not sure, are you, you're you still practicing it, correct? No, I actually, that's that was part of my uh, quarter life crisis, which I'm sure we can, I'm sure we're going to touch on. I eventually let that go and I'm not practicing anymore. I haven't been for over three years now. Okay. So when you did practice, did you um, like have an office somewhere or did you actually align with maybe a sports team or something like that? Because I know every mm. sport team has physical therapists or physiotherapists on their, you know, as part of their uh, management and, and there to take care of the athletes. Yeah, 
So as a new grad out of uni, my dream was to work with a sports team. Um, you know, I wanted to be able to travel and I wanted to um, work with elite, you know, elite sports. That was the epitome of making it as a physiotherapist or physical therapist over there. Um, but to start where I began was in a private clinic. So think about those clinics that are stationed anywhere in the suburbs or, um, you know, and the, you know, people come in for private private appointments. So my typical day would look like going into work for a six or eight hour shift. And it would generally be, you know, back to back appointments where I'll be seeing different patients, the in and then the out. That's what it looks like. kind of alluded to it let's talk about that quarter life thing that happened because I kind of <laughs> know what it was but I I want to hear it from you the listeners need to know this because it really did change kind of the direction of your life you know yeah yeah um this story is pretty whack so everyone buckle in <laughs> <laughs> you know we we hear a lot about midlife crisis but quarter life crisis is increasingly um, being recognized as this phenomenon where, you know, you, you, you finish school, you enter into the world, and then suddenly, you know, you, you, you learn so much more about yourself and about the world, and then you integrate that with everything that you've previously known, and it creates this mismatch, and it creates this confusion of, oh my gosh, like, where to next? 
So for me, I, I had that. And how that happened was very unexpected because when I was working as a physiotherapist, I was generally comfortable. I was generally doing well. I was generally happy. Until one morning when I'd gone up to go for a run, everything changed. So I stepped out onto the sidewalk to begin my run and hear a crunch. And I'm like, what's that? What's going on? I looked down and it turns out I'd stepped on a snail. Now, this isn't the first time that this had happened before. And I'm sure that many of you have done similar by accident in your life. But for some reason, this particular morning, I couldn't stop thinking about it. For the rest of that run, and it was a long run because I was doing triathlons at the time. I think it was like a two-hour run. So for the rest of that run, I was thinking about this. For the months that followed, I was thinking about this. What I was thinking and kind of mulling over was the, the thoughts and the feelings of guilt. But me just living my own life, doing my own thing, I had caused a, such an effect on something outside of me. You know, in this case, I had killed something just because I decided to go for a run on this day at this exact time. So that thought really stuck with me and I started to see the bigger picture over the coming months. Here I was feeling so guilty about this one snail, yet my life in so many ways had major effects that I'd previously never thought about and never really connected the dots. You know, for example, my lifestyle of, you know, the plastic that I was using or the food that I was eating or the clothes that I was wearing would have a flow on effect on things beyond me that I might never witness. So I started to see this. I started to recognize how much of a footprint I have as an individual. Uh, I started to realize how much of an impact I had. But at the same time, there was this contrasting uh, thought of, I have so much impact, but at the same time, I'm just one person. You know, like I'm I'm still so insignificant. I'm I'm still so helpless. I can never do enough to change the world. So this created these thoughts and these feelings that grew and grew over time because I started to just see all of these problems and all the devastation that was happening in the world that I previously, in my privileged bubble, I, I just would never consider. And then that created this weight on my shoulders because it was like a veil had been taken out from in front of my eyes. I could see stuff that was always always there, but now I actually saw it. So it was like this weight on my shoulders. What this weight was, was that each day I was going into work, I was using my time, my energy, my life to go into work to help people at a very individual level, you know, like I was helping them overcome their pain. I was helping them. Uh, I was also working in the gym. So teaching people how to squat or something just so they can build their booty, <laughs> like a, and make it more perky. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I was doing. Yet I, I felt like I needed to become more and to do more. Uh, I felt like I could see all of this um, out there and I felt the responsibility to use my lifetime to create as much impact as possible, not just at an individual level, but at a global level. And I really felt that um, I really felt that conflict because here I was, I've just my whole life, I thought that my goal was to get this university degree and have this job that I was going to stick to for till the end of my days. That was everything that I understood about myself and about my path in life. And then at the same time, I had this pull to change and to do more and to become more and to explore this wide, big, wide world out there in terms of how else I can create an impact. So that was the conflict and it was very confusing. So I remember actually having a conversation with my business mentor at the time, because around this time I, I was starting uh, my own uh, personal training business as well. So I had a business mentor and I remember asking him, you know, like, how can I make as much uh, of a difference as possible? Like, should I do extra volunteering? Should I start a non-for-profit? Should I do some activism? And I remember what he said was so profound. And this is what he said. He was like, Trang, you want to make a difference, right? Well, what if you 
don't have to be on the front lines just to make a difference. You know, imagine you are alive during uh, war times. Like, could you make a difference by becoming a doctor and working in the hospitals to help the injured soldiers? Or could you also make a difference by taking a step back away from the action and work on becoming the person who ends the war? Yeah. And my mind was blown because this whole time, you know, what I thought I needed to do was to go on the front lines and treat the visible symptoms of what I was seeing. So I don't know if there was injustice, if there was devastation happening to the rainforests, I thought that I needed to be the one who goes out there and plants new trees or to do some activism or something like that. But then I realized that's not the only way to make a difference. Like there are so many different stages along this um, path that I can utilize my skills and my knowledge to contribute. So there can be um, kind of like addressing the symptoms, but that also can be addressing the root cause of the problem as well, which is a little bit more removed from the symptoms. Now, now this and, happened at the age of 24, right? Yeah. So this, <laughs> this whole, in terms of the timeline, this, this thought process and, you know, these, these um, sequence of events was about over 12 months, uh, over a period of 12 months from 24 to 25. So okay. it was like a year of being torn, feeling like I was at crossroads. What should I do? And I kind of knew what I wanted to do because I had caught myself saying out loud, I know I'm not going to do physio for the rest of my life. Like I had gotten to that point where I knew it wasn't it for life. But then also, you know, my ego and my fears and, uh, you know, fear of failure, fear of judgment, all those things were, were very prevalent in my mind as well. So it was going back and forth for a long time. So did you talk to your folks about this? Nah, at this point, they're, they're not involved anymore. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, at this point, um, I had moved out of home. I was living with my partner at the time, and this was my own journey to explore. Okay. So for about 12 months, you were kind of thinking this through, still doing the personal training, still doing some of the physiotherapy type of, of things. But then at some yeah. point, you thought, okay, I'm ready now to do treat the root cause of the problem. Yeah. Which, what is the root cause of the problem? Well, how I started to see it was that, you know, all of these problems that I was seeing in the world, whether it's like, you know, devastation to wildlife, to the ecosystems, uh, humanitarian issues, they're all separate problems, but they're all different spokes of the same wheel in that the cause, the root cause of all these problems come down to humanity. You know, like people, people, you know, the world is in the hands of people because we are, have so much power in this world. If I treated one spoke of the wheel, it wouldn't necessarily affect the other spokes of the wheel. But if I got to the middle of the wheel and addressed the part of the wheel that would affect every single spoke, then that could really make an impact. And what that was for me was human consciousness. Now, how conscious and heart-led and aware people are about themselves, about their actions and the impacts of those actions, essentially the journey that I had gone down, uh, you know, the, the awareness and being not just mentally aware but emotionally and spiritually connected to that reality. You know, not just knowing things because we all know, you know, like we all know that this is happening out there. We hear about it in the news. We, it passes by us every single day. But until we really feel the magnitude of this reality that we are a part of and we are contributing to, only then does that lead to changes in our behaviors and in how we want to live our life. Only when we really feel it, like what I felt. You know, that weight and that pressure of responsibility when I had that veil taken from in front of my eyes. So human consciousness was what I wanted to, was how I saw myself being able to contribute and to serve because I had a, because I, I developed the skill of influencing people, you could say, right? Like in physiotherapy, in personal training, in one form or another, I was working with people to inspire them and to help them rise up to be their best version of themselves. 
So I had that, I had that skill that I developed. So I wanted to use that in a more expanded context. So not just working with people in their physical health, but in the transformation of the core of who they are, not just as athletes, but as human beings. So that's when I started to go down this new path of leaving physiotherapy behind and starting my business where I was doing life and mindset and business coaching to help people serve their purpose and create businesses of impact in a way that they are passionate about. I assume that's about the time you started your podcasting as well. Mm. Because as a podcaster, you know, again, look at all the spokes, right? When you are sending out a message and maybe instead of just the physical aspect of someone uh, that needs help, you're you're dealing with the emotional and the mental side of things too. And you can do that, you know, if your podcast is centered around that type of thing. So, and again, I've, I've listened to a couple of your, your episodes. And so I know that a lot of what you're talking about right now is kind of what you're talking about in your podcast episodes as well. Yeah. Yeah. That was the time that I started the Alliance Performance Podcast. That was the time that I started mentoring and and coaching for people in their businesses and and in their lives as a whole Um, and speaking as well, because, you know, there are so many different ways to contribute. Uh, I, I can work with individuals and help them transform their lives and transform their worlds that they are a part of. Or if I do the podcast or if I do speaking engagements, then I can literally in one uh, speaking engagement, I can reach dozens, hundreds, like thousands of people. Like social media has been a big part of my business journey. And, you know, there's a lot of different opinions about social media, but I think it has so much power for good. And just like anything, you know, anything can be utilized in positive or in less positive ways, anything, right? You Mm -hmm. know, a a knife can be used to cut some food, but can also be used to hurt someone. So social media is the same. Like it can be used in uh, in unresourceful ways. It can be very addictive and it can really be a big time waster. But also look at how much information and awareness that humanity as a collective has been able to receive because of the internet and because of social media. So yeah, I I love to be active on social media, share my message, talk about different perspectives and different experiences and not to tell anyone what to think or to do, but simply to share my story and my experiences. And if it touches someone along the way, then amazing. And you're sharing your story right now. And we met through social media. We did. We did. Because otherwise, how would we have ever crossed paths? I mean, there might have been at some point, but the chances are more slim because we are on other sides of the globe from each other. Yeah, we are. And, and you know, and I know that I, I'm looking at my clock, so I know you you only got about 10 more minutes, but let's let's talk a little bit at some point. And I'm going to leave it up to you because this is your story. But I just want to get your take on Bali because I know you've been there multiple times and you must like it. Yes. Yes. As um as we as you mentioned before, Larry, this is my fourth month here in Bali. I am going back home uh to Melbourne next month because I'm running a retreat there. Um but I've been living here for the last four months and I I yeah, this has been such a wonderful experience for this point in my life because I never got to do the whole gap year thing. Yeah, I, my story was I went straight from school to work and I just went straight into that path. Yet my younger cousins, when they ask me for my advice and share kind of my perspective, I say, go do it. Like go and travel, go take a gap year, go and learn more about yourself and expand your mind and expand your awareness of the world and different cultures. Like that is such a character developing experience, so much more than just sitting in the classroom and going straight to uni, I believe at least. And both, both have their place, right? But if we expose ourselves to more, then we get to develop all the different parts of us. So I really believe in that, you know, like I said, experiential person, I am so big on experience being gold in our life. So I never got the opportunity to do that because I never thought to. It was just, it just wasn't an option. But then 
recently, this year, I went through what you could say <laughs> was a second quarter life crisis. I had my first one, which is when I changed careers, started my business from just stepping on that one snail, which by the way, highlights how it's the smallest events in our life that do have the power to create the most meaningful change. You know, every day we have opportunity knocking on our door to carve out a new path in our life. We really do. You know, the smallest events, just stepping on a snail, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this year I had, you could say, a second quarter life crisis where I really was challenged to look at the paradigms that I was currently having and experiencing in terms of relationships. So what I'm referring to is this year I separated from an almost decade long relationship. It was nine and a half years. We weren't married, but we were pretty much married and we were going to um, because it was a beautiful, uh, healthy, loving relationship. And we were so happy at this. We were going to ride or, and, or, and die together, you know, like that was it. But over the last six to 12 months, just through my development and through me um, stepping into my truest and fullest expression, I started to realize that we were growing in different directions. And that's sometimes natural because, you know, I'm an individual who's constantly evolving. My partner uh, was is an individual going through his own evolutions. And our relationship itself is a third entity almost. It's like this ever-evolving entity of its own. So there are so many moving parts. And in this instance, it became the most right thing and the most honorable thing for us to do to honor ourselves and our truths and our desires and our needs to actually go in different directions. So this was a really big journey in itself because traditional Vietnamese is you don't get divorced and you know you, you stay with one person for life so this was a huge paradigm shift as I started to explore what relationships meant I never needed to question it I just took on what you know the mainstream narrative was and I never needed to question it because I was in a happy long-term relationship um, but what that led to was the opportunity for me to just have the whole world as my oyster all over again. I felt like I was 18 years old finishing high school where, you, you know, you're in graduation where you do all the speeches and it's like your world is your oyster, though the world is your oyster. And I had that because at this point in time, I was now no longer attached to someone and their lifestyle and, and their uh, kind of their attachments. I had developed my business to be like 95% online. So I had location flexibility. So I was like, I've I've given my younger cousins my perspective to go out there and to see the world and to make the most of this human experience. And now I can do this. So why not? Why not do this and explore and experience and and see the adventure playgrounds that planet Earth is? So yeah, I decided to pack a suitcase. Managed to fit my whole life into one suitcase and an overnight bag. And I've I've come to Bali to live here, but also to travel. So I've stayed in Indonesia this time around because, like, you know how different um, people in different cultures, they have different things that they value. And, for example, in the corporate world, something that is a flex is, you know, what your job title is, what your uh financial position is but in the world of travel the flex is how many countries you've been to and I was aware of that and I didn't want to fall into that trap of just like wanting to go to countries just so I could say that I'd been to more countries I'd rather immerse myself in one place get to know the culture learn the language experience all that one country has to offer like Indonesia has thousands of islands it's one of the most rich cultures uh, as well as beautiful um, landscapes, volcanoes, waterfalls. Oh, my gosh, incredible. I've gotten to experience so much here. Uh, I've gotten to meet different people from all different cultures. Like Bali is, you know, such a uh, an international spot in that people from all over the world come here to pass through or to live here. I've gotten to see and do some incredible adventurous things. Um, I've hiked a few volcanoes in the middle of the night to watch the sunrise at 5.30 a.m. in the morning. Next 
uh, in a fortnight, actually, I'm going to hike the tallest volcano in Bali. Uh, and that's going to be a big feat because I've always had it in my mind, but it's always scared me, like knowing that it's the tallest volcano. It's an active volcano as well. And yeah, just being in a different, being in a different um, culture like be, being away from home is a massive opportunity to observe ourselves in a different environment and how we respond and how we can grow and just see ourselves in a different light. So it's been a beautiful time where I've gotten to learn more about myself. I've gotten to experience more. I've really gotten to expand my world. And traveling is a way of, of learning because you're, like you say, you're meeting different cultures, different people, sometimes different climates. I love to travel. I, 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 it's not all about, like you say, it's not about all the countries because I haven't been to that many, you know, compared to a lot of people, but, but I go, and if I like it, I go back and, and that's yeah. kind of, yeah, I think you were, you were in Bali prior to this time, I think a year ago, maybe. Um, yes. And, and maybe that was, I don't know if that was your first experience, but then after this breakup, now you had the freedom to come and stay longer. And maybe you wouldn't have, if you were still together. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think so because, um, yeah, my partner is in a corporate job. So he's more, uh, so my ex-partner, I'm still getting used to saying that. It's been five <laughs> months, but I'm still getting used to saying that. Um, so yeah, you know, he's bound to a location, which he is so happy with. Yet then for me, you know, that rebellious wanting to explore, wanting to experience every single corner that this life has to offer, I wanted to get out there more. So yeah, it's been a catalyst for us to, both of us, because we, we're still great friends. You know, I caught up with him this week over FaceTime. It's been a catalyst for both of us to learn more about ourselves and to soak as much as possible from the school of life, you know, one of the best schools. <laughs> I sure appreciate you taking the time. I know that we're we're uh, out of time for today, but let's let's hear again the name of your podcast. I don't think we've actually said it, have we? Yeah, for sure. So the the podcast is called the Aligned Performance Podcast. Aligned performance. So a performing in our life in a way that's aligned to our heart's purpose, our values, and our truth. Okay. And I'll put it in the show notes as well. Um, but yeah, Twang, thank you so much for taking the time today and telling your story. I, I knew it would be interesting. And and like you say, you've you've had a quarter life experience, maybe a quarter of a quarter life experience after that. But these experiences, this is life, right? This is the ups and downs, the twists and turns. And it's, as we look back once, you know, we're, we're near the end or whatever, it's these experiences that make life worth living, I think, many times. Absolutely. Like if I were to wrap up with one final thought, that would be it. Like I said before, experiences make our life if if we only ever had it good and if it was only ever smooth sailing, it would eventually get boring. So no matter the experience, whether we want to label it in one way or another, it is gold in itself and is what makes this beautiful human life that we have. Absolutely. Thanks, Trang. Thank you, Larry. Loved it. Hey, check back in two weeks for another interesting guest here on Nobody Knows Your Story.